we get started. Uh, thank you so much for being here. And on behalf of the campus, if you're new to the space, and on behalf of the archives at NCBS, I welcome you all to the 24th edition of the Archives Public Lecture Series. Um, it was a good number. That means we complete two years today. So this has been nice. Uh, we also completed a year in the archives last week. And um, on that occasion, we opened um, a new exhibition uh, designed uh, primarily by Abhishek uh, and his team at Matrika Design Collaborative in Bombay. And the exhibition is titled Herbs, Maps, and Medicine, an interpretive exhibition of commerce in spice. Uh, this is going to be a slightly different public lecture. For those of you, if this is the first time that you're part of the series, we typically run a lecture every month with the intent of trying to get different people from different backgrounds, um, talk about uh, material from their body of work. And we've done this, as I said, over the last two years. And um, all the talks in the past have been recorded. And you can see them on the website. You just look for Archives Public Lecture Series. You should be able to find it. Um, if you haven't visited campus before and you haven't seen the archive before, what are you waiting for? Come. Um, this is what we hope you do today. And uh, the archive is just around the corner, and you'll be able to see the exhibition along with the rest of the archive. And there's a bunch of us in the auditorium who can help you, um, I mean, help navigate the process. Um, I'm very thrilled, uh, really, to have this panel of speakers here, um, including Anna, who I, I suppose is also hearing us. As I said, you know, it's 2 30 or plus, a little bit more in the, in the morning for her right now. And it's, it's such a thrill to have everyone, and some of you have such short notice. So what I'm going to do is, uh, it's very simple. Um, I'm just going to introduce the panelists, and then it's my lot of um, sort of uh, task, in a sense, to sort of get everyone's conversations together. So uh, we'll start with Anna's recording. And after that, we'll have Abhishek give a little perspective on the design of the exhibition that they work on. Um, Inez will come after that to give a little reflection on uh, in her perspective as a historian. And Maria Lola will sort of gather everyone's thoughts together and open it up to the audience for questions. So, um, Anna Spodich is someone who this campus knows extremely well. Um, and for those of you who don't know, um, Anna Spodich pursued research in molecular and cell biology at Stanford for 25 years. She was visiting faculty in the Department of Cellular and Molecular Pharmacology, UCSF, and a visiting scientist at Genentech. But over the past 15 years, she's devoted her intellectual energies to her lifelong interest in the history of Indian scientific traditions in the natural sciences. In 2008 and in 2017, she curated two exhibitions at NCBS on the influences of early Indian scientific knowledge in pre-modern Europe. These were titled such treasure and rich merchandise, Indian botanical knowledge in the 16th and 17th century, um, and seeds of culture. In uh, 2018, she published a digital narrative on the Google Arts and Culture platform on the histories of the medicine and spice trade. And this current physical exhibition that you shall see soon draws from her curation, um, which is available on the web. And there's a tablet in the exhibition where you can sort of see that exhibition uh, at length. Abhishek um, and his team at Matrika are the people who designed this exhibition that you shall see soon. Abhishek Ray is the principal architect at the Matrika Design Collaborative, a Mumbai based architecture and design firm. Over 16 years of design practice, he's designed museums and galleries across India. He's worked with curators, conservators, and historians to bring historical and cultural narratives to life. His interest in the science and the arts has led him to delve into archival material and develop this particular exhibition, Books, Maps, and Medicine. In this exhibition, he's brought to the four alternate ways of interpretation through visual art and craft, and he's used layers of paper as a primary building element to signal hidden information present in these historical objects. Uh, he's, uh, he's been supported by his team of architects and space designers, Hussein Kadiwala, Shivani Patil, Rohaya Kinwala, and so on. Uh, Inan Shuknov, uh, who's sitting in the audience here, is a research fellow at the Center for Social Sciences and Humanities in Delhi. Uh, she's also been a research fellow at CNRS in Paris and a former director of the South Asian Studies Center. She's a social and cultural historian of Catholic missions in South Asia and has also worked on other topics related to the Portuguese Empire. She's published, you know, a range of books. She's published 10 books and published chapters and articles in English and French. Um, and on a personal note, I had the thrill of having her, you know, transcribe, you know, live transcribe the Portuguese manuscript from the 17th century in the exhibition yesterday. And uh, this is not an experience that one gets to have very often. So I'm very grateful to Dr. Um, And finally, last but not the least, of course, Maria Lorgadini is a curator whose work explores the intersection between art, technology, and society. She founded the curatorial platform Orbits.com, and since her PhD at uh, the University of Sutherland, she's researched the field of curating on the web. Interested in working with various exhibition formats, the projects include hashtag Xtrange on eBay, the Truman Show in an electronic shop in Bangalore, search engine across public spaces in Birmingham, and 128 KDPS objects. 
on basic data. She's the co-editor of the publishing series Silicon Plateau, and she's a course leader of the MA Tutorial Practices Pathway at Srishti in Bangalore. So we have a very interesting set of speakers today. We have a biologist turned historian, we have a designer architect, we have a historian, and we have a curator. Um, thank you so much, all of you, for being here. We'll start with Anna's uh, 20 minute recording, and then we'll go rubbish. Hello, I am Anna Marit Spudich. Um, speaking to you from my study in California. I'm really sorry not to be able to participate in this um, panel. I would like to have heard the uh, impressions of the other speakers to some of the work that I've done that will be part of the uh, installation that Abhishek Gray has done at the NCBS that you will be seeing um, soon. Uh, Venkat Srinivasan, who is in charge of the um, archives at the NCBS, asked me to give you an overview of how I went from my career as a molecular cell biologist, uh, a laboratory scientist for 25 years, to working on the history of the knowledge traditions in botany and medicine of India and its impact on the larger world. It's actually a story that um, was a small, slow transition, but I have to say that growing up in Kerala, in South India, I've been aware of the rich botanical medical traditions of, in, of India. And of course, I've been a beneficiary of the therapies and treatments of various levels that were part of my life until the age of 19 or so when I left uh, India for study abroad. And I've always, as I developed my scientific career, I became very aware that the traditional medical knowledge systems of India were actually extremely sophisticated. Even though the molecular formulations and uh, identifications hadn't been done, the knowledge systems that we were all brought up with, especially in medicine and botany, um, were the result of centuries of trial and error, and then extracting from it what was meaningful and useful. And in my own personal view, I have come to believe that though we decide and define experimental science as being a Western um, innovation, at least most of the world thinks so. I own, I have my own um, ex work in this area have convinced me that exploration of knowledge by trial and error and then putting it into applications is actually science of a very high level. And this is being practiced in all ancient societies and in India in particular to a very high level. And the result of these explorations were actually the real reason for the spice trade and eventually the colonialization of uh, India at a later time. Because the products, natural products of India, spices and medicines were highly valuable commodities in the uh, beginning of the first millennium for certain, maybe even before. And this knowledge about Indian uh, products and their high value that are actually available uh, throughout the world, certainly by the beginning of the first millennium, and I'm going to show you some evidence about that. For those who are interested to see an overview of the work that I've done in the history of science, uh, history of botany and medicine of India in the last 20 years, here are two links that will take you directly first to an exhibition I did for the Google Cultural Institute, another exhibition uh, that uh, I did in collaboration with Sarita Sundar in 2008. Of course, Sarita is in the audience and I'm sure she will be able to, uh, to talk to you more about it if you're interested. Please feel free to photograph these, this slide so that you have the links. Now, getting back to my own history of how I went from being an experimental scientist to a career looking at the history of Indian medical, botanical medical sciences. I can, the story is actually not straightforward. 
It, uh, like many other things, you go through many iterations and trials. But while I was an experimental scientist, I had the unique opportunity to spend some time in the library at uh, Cambridge University in England. And I was using the time to look through old herbals, European herbals. And I came across this herbal, The General History of Plants by John Gerard, who was an apothecary in Elizabeth in England at the end of the 16th century. I was amazed to see this image of the ficus tree. And on further examination, I found that there were 200 Indian plants with medicinal properties that was described in Gerard's book. What impressed me in the introduction was that Gerard says that he had never been to India. So Gerard accumulated all this knowledge about the um, description of the plants as well as the medicinal properties of the plants he reported from travelers and or from information that was circulating throughout Europe at the time. So already by the 16th century, much information and also materials were available in Europe from India, among other Asian, um, Asian countries. So here is actually another very important document, which uh, is now in the Austrian National Library, which is called the Mussoris Papyrus. This is a loan agreement for shipment of goods from Mussoris uh, near Kochi to Alexandria, Egypt. The text is in Greek and is dated to the second century. And this document goes into great detail about the conditions of shipment, etc. But what's important to us is that the major materials being shipped were uh, medicinal herbs as well as cotton, as well as dyed woven cottons, both of which are really results of knowledge developed in India. In the case of cotton, much of Indian cotton in, uh, that was exported from India was dyed with indigo. And the chemistry of the dyeing of indigo was worked out in India at the very early part of the first millennium. In addition, we see that um, Indian botanical medical knowledge was actually available in various parts of Asia, in Central Asia, in, in the west coast of um, China, and even the Arabian Peninsula. And these are a selection of documents that I was able to discover in the Bancroft Library, um, it's, and also at the Bodleian Library at Oxford and in other libraries around the world. On top left is the Bauer Manuscript, which is on birch bark, dated to the 4th to the 6th century, discovered in Central Asia at the bottom of a Buddhist stupa. This document has been completely translated and we know now that it describes botanical medicines of India, which were available in Central Asia. On the right side is a very important document from the Dunhuang Caves on the western edge of China, describing concept of Tridosha, which, and this is of course one among many such medical manuscripts. And again, in, uh, at the bottom is a Judeo-Arabic prescription for Indian myrobalan. In Kerala, we call it Nellika, which has many, many medicinal properties, and this was uh, found in an archive in the Ben Nisra synagogue in Cairo. And this document is dated to the 12th century. So we know that by this time, knowledge was available from India all around the world. Now let's look at the source of the knowledge itself. And here is interesting uh, frontispiece of a document published in France in the um, 15th century is called, no, 16th century, called the Garden of Orisa. And the frontispiece shows a European seated, and on the right side of the European, he is a scholar physician, perhaps, perhaps of the Ayurveda tradition. The uh, documentation is going on, and also there are collectors, possibly folk uh, healers, and of course a woman who is gathering, um, gathering preparations and you know, medicinal plants for preparation. And of course, the story of the, of the contributions of women in preservation and administration of traditional medicine, of course, is a story in itself that is worth telling. So knowledge about Indian medicinal plants and their uses were actually distributed across all levels of society. 
So once I decided that I was going to leave the laboratory and devote my time to studying the history of the knowledge systems of India in this area, I spent about three years with different physicians uh, practicing traditional medicine in the, but were trained in the Guru Shishya Parambarium, which means that their learning was actually not only from books, but were from previous uh, scholars who practiced the type of knowledge, the type of healing they practiced. Of course, the most important, whose picture I don't have here because I did not get the time to get permission from the family, was Chirataman Narayana Mus, the a, a celebrated Ashtavadya, who was actually basically my teacher. And the 2008 catalog is actually dedicated to him. The other person that I learned a great deal from was a, a Carmelite monk on the right side. He was a folk physician, you might call, but he is a monk healer, uh, a Vaidya in Kerala, who specialized in poison um, bites. The, and it, while I was visiting him several times, I've had occasion to meet patients who were actually sent from the, care, the, the, the Cotton Medical College because the biomedical physicians were unable to heal the wounds that resulted from these poisonous bites, even though biomedicine um, helped them to survive the bite. On the other side, he's a tribal healer based in the Western Guards, renowned for his ability to deal with what they, they, in Malayalam we call Manasi Garogam, diseases of the mind. So knowledge was, in this type of knowledge of botanical medicines were distributed all across society. So once I spent time with these healers, I went back to learning more about the documents that describe Indian knowledge systems, which were put together by Europeans. And here is an, um, a selection of texts which on Indian medicines, which was in the exhibition that I did along with uh, Dr. John Wren at the Stanford uh, Center for Visual Arts. And this is very important for you to take note because all the images described here are from the Hortus Indicus Malabaricus the most celebrated volume of uh, uh, botanical medicines of, of, of Asia, which was done before the time of Linnaeus and actually influenced the botanical characterization of Linnaeus extensively. And this was actually uh, put together by the Dutch, but from knowledge provided by three uh, Ayurveda healers and a folk healer whose name was Itti Achidam. And in fact, Itti Achidam is known, is, is, has been decided to be the primary healer, primary source of, of uh, Hortus Malabaricus because as you probably will see in the installation, in the documents, in the four, volume one of the Hortus Malabaricus, an entire page is dedicated to his handwritten testimonial. The, Beyond the time of the Portuguese and the Dutch in India, British of course came to India in, ma in mass and there large numbers of documentation where documents are assembled by the British having to do with indigenous knowledge systems in botany and medicine. Like you can see titles like fibrous plants of India, cotton in India, uh, plants of the coast of Coromandel because by, by the by, by the 17th, 18th, 18th, 19th century, all of the botanical resources of India were actually coveted commodities. And of course, what I have yet neglected to say yet is that initially the interest in Indian botanical medicines um, became a priority for the colonists, the, starting with the Portuguese, because when they arrived in India, they found that Galenic medicine which was the source of medical knowledge for Europeans, was unable to deal with the tropical diseases. And Garcia Orta, for example, goes on to say that there's, these physicians are scholars of, their, of the highest degree and that they are able to contribute enormously to the survival of the European colonists. So here are a large source of documentation of Indian knowledge which is available and yet has not been explored in depth. And now it's, um, the, of course, there were 
uh, cynical uh, evaluations of traditional medicine, even today from various sources. But a deep study into the area reveals that many of the uh, traditional medical system, many medical systems have provided very, very important lead compounds uh, into biomedicine. And here is one example from India. This is Sarpaganti, bazaar, Indian bazaar medicine, a scientific name, Rawolfia serpentina. It contains the powerful alkaloid reserpine. And uh, reserpine is used for a number of um, chronic diseases, but most importantly, reserpine was used extensively for deciphering the many important aspects of, of human neural pathways. Then there is, of course, the other example of artemisinin, which was discovered from the Chinese herb Artemisia annua, which is now the dominant medicine for um, malaria, a scourge throughout the world. So this is to say that traditional knowledge systems and the history of knowledge and history of science actually has a very, very important contributions that were made from um, Asian societies, especially from India. And according to the one of the you know, um, scholars from um, University of Chicago, he says that the, the you know, European exploration of, of Asia has been given a great deal of, great deal of importance, the, the bravado of the European exploration of India. But he says that the, that the large knowledge systems and the importance of Asian contributions to the development of modern world has not given, has not received the attention it deserves. But I want to leave you with, a, with another note that uh, in addition to scientific contributions, actually European art and literature was also enormously influenced by encounter with the knowledge systems of India. And here is a passage from, uh, from John Milton's Paradise Lost. Many of you have probably had to study it in college. And here is a reference to the fig tree of paradise. And whether or not Milton had an occasion to see this image from Great Herbal, you do not know. But listen to the description. Into the thickest wood where they chose the fig tree, that is Adam and Eve chose the fig tree, not the kind for fruit renowned, but such as to this day, to Indians known in Malabar or Dakar, spreads her arms, branching so broad and long that in the ground, the bended twigs root and daughters grow around the mother tree. Now that is an exact description of the ficus tree from a great herbal. So uh, the exhibition that I referred to, especially the Google project, actually refers to other very, very important examples of the influence of Indian knowledge systems in all different aspects of um, European and life um, up to the 19th century. And I think you would find this material interesting. Thank you. Institution designer, uh, Kinsala Pompey. Uh, we've literally spent the last three weeks in, at NCBS, so it's been a long process of finishing this wonderful exhibition and uh, quite honored to have worked on Anna's project and with the NCBS team in Bangalore. Uh, some of them are here and taking pictures, they're giving wonderful support. Uh, literally working with us through the night uh, with my team, uh, Ashley, Ravi, uh, Neha, all of them. I mean, I had to be there. So it's, it's been a great experience for all of us. We were quite happy to go back to Bombay eventually. So I'm back. And uh, so uh, it's a small space. If you if you go back and if you see this uh, uh, this archive, it's a small space that we developed over time. Uh, I have this submission that, you know, for a long, Time during the process, I never had an idea of how I want to do this, but there was just an initial thought that we wanted to do it out of paper. And uh, paper, because there's a strong connotation to the kind of manuscripts and documents that Anna's exhibition talks about. So, um, if you can just play the first slide, just to 
to be here with special. I just put together a few pictures of the process because I feel that in design, the entire process to the culmination of the space and design the space is very important activity. So, uh, just should I come there? Yes, yeah. So yeah, so just to let you know what the space looked like from the earlier exhibition, it's a, it's a squarish space that we were given. Uh, Anna's curatorial note and the collection were about 24 odd objects that we were working with. Uh, the first few objects were ones that we started working with and had an initial idea. And we developed the entire exhibition sitting here in NCBS. So it was just a process that, that started at NCBS and ended with the exhibition. Uh, one of the first walls that we worked with and one of the first objects that we worked with was the Musician's document, which is an important document and has layers of information within it. So if you were to look at just that one document, you can take out layers of narratives which can be derived in terms of the value of these herbs, the trade that was happening, uh, <coughs> the kind of material, the media that it was written on. So all these sub-narratives were things that we wanted to connect and broaden upon in the exhibition uh, design. So the entire wall on the left, which you which you see you see towards the I mean when you go there, is the process of exploration. I mean the first thing was to explore uh, the entire uh, so to say the, the the exploration of spices in India. So what we did was through a very visual narrative tried to build with paper these connections across that wall and through and jumping objects all across. So. It's, it's the reason why we do, did this was that we wanted to do an experiment with paper in terms of a crafting exhibition, which explores, uh, you know, the, we didn't really want to work with printing and machine and, and, and computerized notes because we wanted to do it ourselves, be there and cut things out. So uh, just to let you know how this happened, was this is the earlier exhibition and we did an entire framing around the space to encompass it with Paper. And, and so the first boards came up to literally cover the entire space with a uniform surface that we could work with. And that's how uh, it all started. That's the completed space. So there is no sort of remnant of the earlier exhibition or the, or the walls as such. And what happened is that it gave us an entire canvas to work with. It's an open canvas that we could stick on, add things, remove things, even correct or amend. So that's the advantage of working with paper. So as we move forward, this is the process. I mean, this is one of these pictures taken in the middle of the night where we were working. We had the, the collection coming in as the main screen, but we had a visual narrative that was slowly developing from the first wall. This was the wall that we first designed and we were sure about, but the rest of it kind of pulled through. You know, it just sort of came through as we worked on it. So what we did was that we had images and maps and the manuscripts coming in, but we had a visual narrative in terms of connecting it to geographical understanding of where it all started, the trade routes, the, you know, we, we took Jatamansi as the spike now, which is mentioned in the music, music document, and we connected it to the habitat in the Himalayas. So you have that entire sort of range developing across on the upper half of the <coughs> exhibition. The space was very constrained. So we had to kind of make do with optimized, you know, uh, special sort of, uh, you know, solutions that we had. So this is the first instance how we sort of, and then we started doing things which were much more crafty in terms of, we started making an entire profile of the Jatamansi plant, which is, which is out here, right here, which is the spikena, and connecting it to various components of the, of the, uh, of the collection as such. And that's, that's the team working on uh, that space. Now, what, what, what you see out here is that that board has been covered with an entire envelope of paper, which is craft paper. So this gives us the freedom to work with, you know, attachment of 
uh, collection, uh, collections and write-ups and all of those things kind of sort of blend in out here. And then we also decided that we have to write it ourselves because you know a lot of this text that we wanted to put in was uh, what needed to be written rather than printed because it's an exercise that we wanted to sort of uh, you know it's, it's an interesting process to write yourself and coming back to our learning as architects and spatial designers to, to be able to contribute to an exhibition of this sort so we we were we were writing through the exhibition across the labels and the sort of the connections that we built that's uh, and it also involved uh, crafting to the extent that we were even creating small uh, lighting installations. If you see, when you go into the space, so there are certain lighting installations that we worked with in terms of creating small LED devices which would light up maps and uh, you know documents and all of that. In fact, this is an interesting sort of an experiment that we're doing with Drapery. One of, one of us was trying to do a mock-up of a, of a monk in terms of having the, you know, the very Gandharan drape across the body, which we eventually sort of dropped because it was too big an affair. So we kind of shortened it and showed it in a different pattern altogether. That's us. I mean, we, we had a great time at NCBS working on the, on the project as such. And um, that's the team that developed it. They're unfortunately they're not here, they're in Bombay at the moment. That's Soham, Hussain, Shivani, and Rukaya. They're all interns and architects and spatial designers who work with us. Um, another important part which you would also see is we did deconstruct a few of the collections like the Arab Tao, which is a painting, and it's right at the entrance on the left. And what we thought was to understand the foreground, the middle ground, and the background of the image through a paper exhibit that we developed. And uh, yeah, so this is a kind of a short introduction to what the process was in terms of design. But uh, essentially, the entire process was much more uh, intensive in terms of doing it in a very impromptu way. And uh, yeah, I mean, if I'm open to questions and any suggestions that you have regarding this exhibition. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Shirley. <laughs> okay, so I, I have a couple of jottings uh, that I want to stick to. So I'm going to lose my uh, line of thinking here um, so because I was invited here basically to come on the exhibition and I'm going to see the exhibition. Now we've seen how it came to be, and uh, well, I will tell you something about uh, what I thought. Maybe uh, important about, about to know to know about uh, if before you go and see it. It would have been even better if you have seen it. Uh, so first of all, I, I would like to say uh, one general thing, which is like never underestimate small exhibitions. Uh, never underestimate uh, small stories, and never underestimate. Small people, maybe short people, okay, but small people, uh, small uh, actors, historical actors, uh, don't pass them by. Um, I think this is um, smallness is in a way my epistemological, analytical, and ethical, <coughs> and if you want, ethical motto. It is my prism, uh, <coughs> prism through which I pass my uh, research. Uh, but it's, it is also a way, uh, in a way, my prison, but you know, everybody has his uh, own prison, so this is mine. Um, so, small, local, um, you can also call, I mean, it leads us to actually uh, uh, think of the world in, in a kind of inductive way. We start with an anecdote, a small thing, and then we go further and maybe find. Um, <coughs> big objects, big people, big, uh, big stories. Um, so <coughs> I'm disclosing my uh, kind of 
which is the historical uh, plots, or like historical orientation, which is microhistory. And I don't know if you know the work of Howard Gilbert, but this is basically where I um, kind of the history that I am trying to do is not always easy to do because it means, uh, means that you have to really know the locality, local languages. It's something that is really hard to get and takes time. Today, uh, probably the most um, famous, um, you know, when you study, if you go for PhD in history, you will encounter and maybe get seduced by something that is called global <laughs> micro history. So, so here it is. Um, so, I must say that this exhibition that I've seen now three times, um, I say, in, 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 I, 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 in three different, on three different occasions, I had to, to sort of understand what's going on, to have three different uh, kind of beginnings of understanding. Um, I think this exhibition, uh, okay, the, the ultimate, the bottom line is, uh, is that it resonates with my, uh, let's say, technical expectations. Uh, it is at the same time a kind of a baroque uh, exhibition. All of little things, nooks and crannies, and you just have to look for them. Um, but it is also modest and understated, which I find again uh, important. Um, it is playful. You will see when you go to see it and actually play with it. There are all kinds of tricks and riddles for you, and you can add something. On the book, on, on the notebooks. Uh, yes. uh, then it is also, I found it a little bit nostalgic. We can talk about it. what do I mean by nostalgic. Nostalgic for all kinds of simpler things, maybe, uh, compared to today, our world of machinery and WhatsApp and, and you know, all this media. This is a kind of Nostalgic, nostalgia for simpler media of representation, let's say. It is also flat, as you heard, there are three walls, so flat. But at the same time, um, it is striving for tri tri dimension dimensionality. Uh, because there are those little pop-ups, and all those little strings, and they are uh, pulling us towards third, fourth or third dimension. Um, uh, it is also, in fact, pretty much global. I mean, there's like, uh, there are other continents missing, but there is a kind of a global feel. Asia itself is, is a good part of the world. Um, it is also economical, I presume, not very expensive, uh, but it is rich. In many ways, it is rich. I hope that you uh, that you would discover that. It has a lot of little surprise effects for you if you look very closely. It is also didactic, which is important, uh, because you want to know more about plants, about this particular period in time, which is actually my specialty. Uh, but it is as well poetic. Um, and so, so there is a, it, it's a very measured didact didacticism, not too much of information. Uh, and it is very, and it is measured Measurably poetic. It doesn't go all overboard to strike us in, I don't know, some kind of touch of our feelings too much. So, I just want to answer two questions that I posed to myself and want to answer to you. Um, one of them is, um, um, and this is, this is maybe something to do with the winter school uh, where I was invited and I gave a lecture. Days ago, on a very similar topic, in fact. Um, how does it fit into discussions? I'm sorry, this is a very local question. But how does it fit into our discussion, uh, discussions in the winter school? And I want to also say something about what is this exhibition doing for me? But not for me, but for me as a historian. So these are the two questions I want to address. More. Um, there was somebody in uh, interesting who said, I think it's Roland, uh, who said something yesterday 
in the heat of the argument, uh, telling history dif that we should uh, learn how to tell dif history differently than texts. Okay, and that it has to do stuff with this current uh, material term, right? As opposed to discursive term that we had before the post structuralism And um, so, uh, of course, this is very complicated because how do we define text? How do we define history? How do we define telling? These are how do we we have to historicize those terms. We have to also see how you know these terms in English, everything is always in English. These, these terms are actually uh, I mean we other people in other languages were uh, thinking about uh, the same concepts. These are concepts. Uh, so um, how it, it is not exactly uh, easy to transpose something, uh, our conceptual apparatus of today, into the conceptual apparatuses of other people and concept conceptual apparatuses of the past ages. Uh, what is the style? Uh, what is uh, Itihasa? What is, you know, Smriti and Shruti? What are those? These are some kind of historical uh, uh, Kisa, uh, historical uh, histories as well. So they, this is a, a kind of a complicated issue of what is text, and this is what we were discussing about. And we were discussing what is text and what is not text, and how can we tell a story without text. So I was reminded of something of, since I've been working on missionaries uh, all over the world in a kind of global context about kipus. Kipus are this kind of knotted uh, strings or knotted. I would say it looks, looks, they look beautiful like necklaces, where by touching each knot, uh, Peruvian people, the indigenous in, uh, uh, in, uh, um, or Indians or whatever you want to call it, people were actually recording their history. Uh, so they were recording history, of course, what is the history is always about people who matter. So they were recording histories about the dynasties, the recording of history of, of the bad harvest or good harvest. So it has been studied. These things have been studied. So, um, so this is a way to store the past. We are, you know, we are storing the past and we are kind of relating that by storing the things of the past, we can also relate to the past. And of course, Missionaries that I studied were really deadly. I mean, they, they were really <laughs> deadly for those traditions. But they, they really thought that this was invented by the devil because uh, uh, this kind of traditions were basically making people uh, uh, indifferent or, or uh, rejectful of their message that they were proposing. So these traditions had to be destroyed. Uh, of course, they couldn't do that, luckily, thankfully. Um, uh, so, because these things were ba basically preserving not just history, but also memory of the great uh, In other words, they created their own texts, which then told another stories, other, other type of stories, and replaced those uh, stories that were already in the society. Interestingly, very interestingly, very <laughs> ironically, those chronicles, very often they were chronicles, these chronicles at the same time were, because of course they were interested in these pagan uh, remnants, these chronicles that they wrote in a linear way as the texts uh, are written, linear fashion uh, rather than kipus that are not linear. Um, these chronicles were the, the histories of the conquerors, uh, uh, of the con conquered by the conquerors, obviously. Uh, but at the same time, these are today probably the most important sources, archives, for um, 
uh, understanding histories of those people because these are the sources, the only sources that survive. And uh, so, you know, it is, and of course, we historians invent all, all kinds of letters to read them. One of them is, as uh, some other studies said, reading against the grain. Uh, but we have some other theories of, of reading uh, interstitially, uh, uh, you know, teasing out voices that were in these kind of texts and that we have to know how to read them. And this is, for example, the experimental uh, ethnology will do that very well. Uh, and of course, in your presentation, at least what you sent me over your email, you were even using, you used the word deconstruction. So I said, oh wow, Derrida is back, because Derrida is really much, uh, Jack Derrida is really much not in anymore in the social sciences or in the kind of academia. So, uh, because, and I, bet I was happy that you mentioned him, because this is really, he was really fighting the written word. And, Showing the, the barriers of the written word uh, because it is really full of power and authority and smothers other written words. It's agonistic. Uh, um, uh, but he himself was, of course, a verbal virtuoso who could play with language and say nothing about saying a lot of things. So, this uh, exhibition um, is really combining objects and things. And, um, and it is, um, so, so it is pointing, the exhibition itself is pointing to the importance of visual epistemology. Thankfully, there is no smell and there is no music, uh, because I think that would be too much for a small space. Thank you. It was for the tribute of music. And I was really, uh, it was in, in this minimalist sense, uh, there were only three options, let's say paper, string, and then small pins and clips or something. Um, and they were pins and clips connecting uh, all these other things. Uh, and they were all serving as representations of objects. Um, and there is only one uh, sort of fully fledged, let's say, authentic historical object, which is itself a representation. It's one of the photos of the small abaricus original uh, drawing uh, right? um, So, um, in this, in our winter, from winter school, I was, I heard a lot the word deconstructing. So we have to, we have to reconstruct things. But I would like to say that here, you should also use another word, very obvious word, which is translate. Because this is all translation from one language into another, and Corpus Indicus Malabarti has four languages and uh, three scripts. So uh, it is important to say that. Um, so this is not about telling history, uh, this is about performing history, right? And um, I must say, as an academic historian, <laughs> we, we in our, our trade is really in works. Uh, we are actually, you know, we cannot dance the history of dance. We cannot sing the history of, of, of uh, music. So it, we can only describe it in words. So um, we can translate, transpose. And that is what we, of course, do. But, um, you know, we belong to an institution which probably came into being in the fifth, end, of, end of 15th century, it's not such a big discipline of history. Um, and this discipline of history has its rules. And, and we are not only trained in a particular way, in particular methods, we get jobs or not, or grants, if we play the game and we don't think we get. Okay, our promotion is in question. I mean, there is a socially situated uh, discipline, you know, for, uh, socially situ situated knowledge and also socially situated uh, pr producer of the knowledge. Uh, and it's us. Um, so we simply cannot do what you do. <laughs> uh, 
Um, and so for, for me, it was important that what you did by reshuffling knowledge, by making it in a, you know, telling the story in a different way, uh, you are helping me get out of my, let's say, historical routine in which I, I don't know how to start and how to end the sentence. With your uh, exhibition, I don't know exactly, which is great because then I can suddenly see new objects and new uh, issues. Um, so it is this kind of, uh, exhibitions are occasion, because I've seen other, occasion uh, that give me a chance to see differently uh, something that I actually know in a different way from academic point of view. And, and, and helping, of course, I have to, my, my task is to narrativize, to employ, as Hayden White would say, to find connections that are causal. Uh, but what is this exhibition is doing for me now, and uh, finish with that, is um, it's consciously or, or unconsciously, I don't know exactly what you said, is reshuffling those plots. Uh, it is also de hierarchizing uh, events and objects that I have in a particular order in my head. Um, and I would say that honest historians, uh, maybe we can say warp, right, uh, is then combined with your oneric uh, weft. Uh, and so I think that the, the whole theme of paper is really well chosen. And um, because it is a signature object in your, uh, in your exhibition, there are no other materials except, okay, thread, paper is somehow other. What I find it incredible is that I didn't notice it. I didn't notice the paper. I have to finish this for purposes, okay? Um, okay, so. This is a very beautiful little box, a uh, little camera obscura, obscura, where things are moving in spite of the fact that they are glued on the wall. Um, it is very dense, so it's both local and global in scale. Um, full of crossroads and uh, boundary crossers, uh, of which I made a paper, and um, it is a discrete, not boastful. Um, and it is allowing viewer to see things according to his or her imagination, which I think is the point. It is not ideological, not authoritarian. Uh, it is rather biological. And so, um, uh, uh, as a historian, um, <laughs> I can say this exhibition is doing what I am not allowed to do uh, and what I am not uh, expected to do. Uh, uh, and I guess uh, this is going to be a kind of eye-opener <laughs> to a lot of things that, you know, desires are there uh, that we can do it. So it's good that somebody is doing it. <laughs> okay, thank you. Hi everyone, I want to thank you, Anna, for your talk, Ines, and Abhishek. Um, and thank you for your. We shall be with each one else, should we speak with the microphone? Each other? In what? Yeah. Yeah, I'm here because I don't know if you can listen. So, I, I mean, what I find fascinating about this, this panel, which I think is also very evident from uh, talks, is that each of you come like, from kind of like, different disciplines and different perspectives, and you're working together. Um, you all came together with your perspective and skills to try to create an interpretation of uh, like a very uh, rich, very rich material. So, and it's uh, an exhibition about 
exchange, and as you, you know, as you just said in your talk, uh, the exhibition about exchange, but it's like uh, the fact that you're working together is also becoming an exchange amongst you, as you just seen as that, you know, your partnership has just been doing something. Um, you know, I, I don't think I would have been able to do what you're also doing something that is making us, you know, uh, things very interesting. So, although I know that you didn't directly collaborate in talking to each other um, that much during the process of the exhibition, um, which actually started along with the, like, your research and the red catalog of your exhibition, I just wanted to ask a question for each of you. Um, um, especially in relation to this idea of interpretation, interpretation and then translation, how, what were the challenges uh, in, in trying to find like a, a perspective in art and for bringing together these like, various material, which is also, I mean, it, it's also very interesting because it's loaded with history because it, it talks about the first interactions, you know, between the East and the West. Uh, before colonial times. So it's a question for both you, Anna, but also you, Abhishek, and to you as well. Um, so who wants to start first, maybe? Anna, would you like to start first? Are you speaking? Okay, okay. one second. Um, just one minute, I'll tell you when you're on. Can you try to speak now? Um. Did you ask me a question because it was hard for me to hear? Yeah, I wanted to know um, what were the challenges for you in collecting this material, bringing it together, um, not for, for this like, current display, but like when you started to do this research in simulation to the previous exhibition catalog and what you did with the Google Ads actually. Uh, um, if you are speaking to me, uh, I actually was not able to hear the question clearly. Were you asking me what were my challenges on working on the project? In, yeah, in researching your material, collecting it, you know, researching, collecting your material, bringing it together to propose a perspective on like, this movie. On your, can you hear me? For me, this was a, basically a labor of love. As I said in my uh, brief uh, talk earlier, I came to this from, from science. Originally, I was actually looking for information about traditional medicine um, based on interest in discovering small molecules that may be of interest for uh, chronic diseases. And I knew from the uh, science scientific aspect that 50 of the most commonly used medicine in use every day is actually discovered from traditional medicines. That includes aspirin, Ipica, codeine, and so on. So, but on the other hand, while, this in, while inquiring into this area, I came across the fact that there was a tremendous amount of uh, indigenous knowledge that was available and had been made accessible to Europeans in the early part of the colonial period. That fascinated me. And to quote from the historian from the University of Chicago, Donald Locke, I was impressed by his statement that the remarkable story of knowledge that Europeans discovered in Asia was left behind, behind the bravado of the European voyages, voyages um, and the process of discovery of Asia. So I became actually much more aware of the fact that traditional knowledge systems of Asia and especially India and its enormous impact on the colonial enterprise and on the global, in the global context actually has been neglected. And this was an area of study that I wanted to engage actually from the point of view of someone who, act, who grew up around this type of knowledge. And also much of this kind of writing and historical perspectives have been done from the Western point of view. And it was time to rediscover the, uh, the profound role 
that Asian knowledge systems had in the global context, and also to see it from the perspective where we are today. So that was my motivation. I don't know if that's the right question you asked me, but as far as discovering the material is concerned, I started with uh, studying with scholars in India to get a better understanding of traditional knowledge systems in botany and medicine. And that started with the, uh, the uh, scholar physicians of Kerala, the Ashtavedyas, uh, all the way to going to libraries and collections around the world to discover what had been recorded by Europeans. So does that give you an overview or mm -hmm. some sort of an answer to your question? Yes, thank you. And uh, maybe from this, then, uh, uh, I think the challenge for you, I wish you could be talking about the space and construct, constructing space and the process that, uh, in your process of uh, designing the space, but what were the challenges of actually creating an art so uh, my background is in historical exhibitions and collections of museums. So this is my first scientific exhibition, uh, or rather an exhibition in a scientific institution. Uh, so yes, it was a challenge because. Uh, uh, the primary uh, visitor uh, mass that we're looking at are people at NCBS and affiliated to the scientific community. So yes, there was a certain sort of a path that we wanted to take, but eventually, uh, I think the the narrative building exercise that we wanted to do was that you know Anna's narrative was always there. You know, it was a very strong uh, connection between various objects and. We didn't want to change that, but uh, we wanted to build uh, smaller secondary and tertiary narratives from each of these objects through a process or a medium of art that we wanted to create. And um, the, although we could do it in some, but the others we wanted to leave the way it is and really not touch uh, uh, that particular aspect and leave it in its uh, in isolation. So if you see something maps on the uh, on the map board, uh, stay the way they are with just the labels being there. And eventually, I mean, uh, when we started working on it, we realized that there are three sort of main uh, thematics that could be developed from it. One is the exploration, then the second, the use of maps uh, as a as a as tool for power and probably even finding, I mean, colonization as such. And the last part, which is the manifestation of this knowledge into books of knowledge and medicine have come in the third wall. But what we intended to do and we could achieve to a certain extent was kind of cross-reference across three walls and the objects together. We did it to a certain extent and we hope that, uh, in the hope that, you know, we develop more connections between them over a period of time. So what we left was, we, I mean, right from the beginning, also, what we thought was we want this to be a dynamic exhibition in terms of where visitors contribute towards the development of various narratives and stories that they can think of. So one of the reasons why these yarns were also connected across the three worlds was to evoke that sense of, uh, you know, uh, participation or adding anecdotal notes to that, to this exhibition. So, uh, so then, it, it, how direct could we possibly be in terms of do we do we leave behind the ideas and notes on these yarns for people to sort of explore and and add to this exhibition, or do we just leave it the way it is? You know, in the sense that there is no uh, prompt there and let people sort of add things. So like in, in the last few days, what we realized was it was going in a different direction. People were adding, you know, <laughs> they were adding uh, comments on the exhibition rather than sort of. Uh, developing connections between them. So we were, we were sort of brainstorming as to how we can evoke that sense of uh, uh, participation in that exhibition. So we just really hope that there is, across these uh, five months of it being installed here, uh, there are people from the scientific community who can contribute to this exhibition as contributors, not as guests and visitors and people who are in the audience. 
I don't know if that answers your question, but that has been a very big challenge for us. And it's, it's, it's something that I really look for because um, having done historical exhibitions with collections which have been on decorative arts and paintings and all of that, it, it is a direct assimilation of that object. But in this case, we are looking at multiple sort of ramifications from one single object which could, which could be stories, I mean, I would expect, like, in this space, I would expect biologists, I would expect, you know, uh, geographers, I would expect uh, uh, cartographers, all these people coming in and contributing towards this exhibition. And it doesn't necessarily mean that one object or the whole exhibition is of interest to them. I mean, there could be a map board which would interest people who are, who are into cartography, you know, or collect collectors of maps, and they could actually they would have a, a small bit of information that they would like to add to this exhibition. So that one of the reasons why we did this uh, exhibition or a paper was the fact that give them the medium to write, give them the medium to add and annotate this exhibition from, and I'm hoping that at the end of it, it's it's like this literally like graffiti wall which develops at the end of it, you know, and then NCBS archives would actually document the entire process of uh, participation of visitors and audiences in this exhibition, which makes it different from a from a historical exhibition because that's very sterile and you know you can't go too close to an object, you know, touch it. Here is something which is more tactile uh, in your face, and it's a, it's a direct representation of Anna's collection. So uh, we just hope that it kind of develops over time. That's 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 a challenge in, in the making and the process of uh, having this exhibition installed. Oh yes, yeah. so um, so I come from a very very different um, milieu. Let's say I'm a historian. Uh, I started by is, we started with PhDs, right? So I started doing my research for PhD, and I was working um, more or less. My advisor told me to do that. Um, I was working on um, Jesuit letters written from um, South India in the 16th, 17th century. I started with French letters and I realized, that, oh my God, before the French there were Portuguese. So I went back, learned Portuguese, and I, I became actually a specialist in Portuguese history as well and Portuguese empire. So in fact, I always, as I said, I start with small things. I start with one letter, two letters, three letters, 3,000 letters, 30,000 letters. And these letters uh, take me in different directions. Uh, one major direction in my research was, of course, conversion to Christianity. So I was following that. But that you can follow in different, um, in different subfields. One of them was uh, looking at translations between um, Portuguese, Latin, and Tamil, for example, I was working on that in, at one point. Um, so to understand uh, how um, conversion works through language. And then I discovered uh, botanical uh, treatises. Uh, I discovered books on medicine, books on uh, recipes, uh, medical recipes. And not just letters, but also so treatises, letters, fragments in the archives describing what um, we would call history of science, right? I suddenly moved into the history of science, had to learn how they do things, and the one thing led to another. And this is why I, one of my points in my last, let's say, bigger book was that the knowledge that the missionaries uh, collected about indigenous um, Indian, uh, South Indian in fact, and South Indian um, medical and botanical traditions, uh, that the missionaries made, uh, collected a huge amount of this knowledge and that this knowledge had not received um, um, has not been studied by, by historians who all start more or less a little bit with Dutch and then with the British. But this Portuguese uh, uh, empire of knowledge, as I call it, 
uh, remained a kind of era in Kohida. Of course, this knowledge was not just Portuguese knowledge, or not just missionary knowledge, or not just French knowledge. This was knowledge in co-production with local literati, local ideas, local hakims, uh, uh, people who were uh, who were uh, who were experts uh, locally. And so, this was one of my uh, crusades was to make this knowledge. Uh, Visible, and I wrote some things about those. Uh, for example, Van um, uh, the, the Dutch, um, the most important Dutch, um, uh, whatever. He was actually uh, administrator. He was working for the Dutch company, and he was administrator. In, in fact, religiously quite a nutcase. Uh, he was not a botanist at all. He was collector of, of things and information that interested him. That he had no training, particular training. So indeed, there were company brands who were uh, providing him with, let's say, more uh, uh, knowledge of, uh, of Ayurveda or, or certain literary, medical literary knowledge. But there were also those herbalists. Uh, Kerala, you were mentioning one of them. Uh, Yerava, Yerava uh, herbalists, but there is one person who is missing on that list, and that is the discussed Carmelite. And I'm so glad that you mentioned Anna, this uh, discussed Carmelite. Today, they obviously are still there. I don't do contemporary. I do only, yeah, discuss the Carmelite father or monk. But the South Carmelites were in, in Kerala in the sixth, 17th century. And one of those, uh, Giuseppe di San Matteo, <laughs> was actually uh, one of, I mean, he was the one who provided uh, paintings I and mean, drawings for uh, Van Hede. And nobody knows about him. And his, uh, uh, his drawings, thousands of them, are in Florence and in Rome, where I worked on them a little bit, not easy. Um, so, you know, there is this, uh, continent of submerged continent of knowledge that was I put as my task also to um, to 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 show, sort of bring up uh, to the surface. So that is all. Thank you. Lots of knowledge has been created through different knowledges. I don't want to um you want to add something, Anna? Or is everything fine? Yeah. Um, were you, um, did you ask me something? I mean, uh, uh, I'm just asking if you wanted to add something in response to what Ines said or? Yes, yes, I do. I do. Um, for me as a, you know, scientist originally and as a, um, Malayali, a Kerala person, Indian person, for me, the most important issue in this whole, uh, series of exhibitions I have done and the work I have done for the last 20 years is that it was the knowledge, it was the Indian knowledge that was at the center of this whole enterprise. The reason why, and um, even though the Europeans of course came and recorded the material as Ines was just referring to, we already know that documents on Indian medical knowledge systems were actually circulating around Asia as in the Bauer manuscript from the fourth century and so on. So the recording of Indian knowledge systems actually did not start with the Europeans. The, mon the fragments from the Dunghuang caves and as well as uh, other documents discovered all along the Silk Road or what is called the Silk Road now, but of course it was the trade routes of Central Asia, record now that Indian knowledge systems were actually recorded very, very early. And what has actually been neglected in most of the material that is being talked about in, in historical documents is, is the fact that it was the botanical medical knowledge systems of India that was available very early, even in the beginning of the first millennium, that actually brought traders and travelers to India. So trade itself, which was the, in fact, um, Goetian, who was the Israeli scholar who has done a great deal of work on the documents from the 
uh, from the uh, Cairo Geniza talks about the fact that India trade was the major commercial activity of the first millennium. And it was all based on the knowledge systems of India. And that is something that I, want, I believe very strongly that has not received the attention it deserves. All of the documentation that was done by Europeans and, uh, and also all of the um, um, you know, papers that are available all around the world and so on, most of it is actually focused on what Europeans were had to do in India. And I think it's time that we discovered indigenous, no I mean, Indian knowledge systems and, and as being the basis of a tremendous amount of activity in the pre-modern world. That is my real focus for, for the work I have done in the last 20 years. Thank you. Um, I don't want the, the, my question to take over, so I just wonder, does anyone have a question to ask to any of our speakers? Maybe in the meanwhile, I have a question. It's a very simple question. I just wonder what, like, for each of you, uh, what is interpretation for each of you? Since uh, each of you, that's something completely, not completely different, as I've seen, everything is interrelated. And uh, so, I don't know, maybe you want to start? I just wonder what it is for you in a very four words while we're waiting for one more question. I think it's down there. <laughs> so, so I, yeah, I mean, illustration for me would be what was created in the, in the exhibition gallery uh, downstairs. Um, again, uh, uh, so, but it, again, it, it's, it's a, it could be something that we can say it's, it's very personal because we are looking at these objects in a, in a close space as architects and as designers and you would look at it differently as a historian. So each one has interpretation which is varied. For me it was uh, more about uh, creating, uh, I mean the first time I saw these objects I could just there were things which were spinning off, you know, in, in various directions, in various subjects, and uh, I mean, uh, I became an architect, but you know, I, I, mean, I almost got into engineering and all of that, you know, the basic stuff. So, I mean, I've been always interested in the arts and the sciences. So, there have been there is a certain amount of interest. My mom was a doctor, so there's a lot of a lot of these things discussed at home in terms of um, you know, local medicine and all of that. So, there is a very different context that I come from or he come from as a, as a design office and uh, uh, my uh, my interpretation of these objects would be more of more of uh, you know how we can rather I would say it's an interpretation but it's about how we can connect to other subjects and other other areas of interest which could which could develop further in this exhibition. I mean it's not a contained sphere of knowledge that we're looking at which is to do with herbs and trees and like the title says so. But uh, there could be many more things that I could add commas and add, add you know, to the fact of this exhibition, which, which would probably, I would say, is, 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 a, is a sort of an infinite uh, number of uh, connections that you develop. So I, I, I don't know that if, if that is interpretive in, in, the, in the correct sense, but uh, in the more literal sense, it is the visual art that we create. I mean, it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's some, taking something which is verbal as an abstract and converting that into the physical and tangible space is, is something that I see as, as an extension of how uh, I imagine this, this, uh, these 24 or 25 objects uh, in Anna's uh, territorial yeah. I, I don't think I can say anything. About <laughs> 
Indeed, this is your interpretation. Your your space is camera obscura, as I said, is is your little box and your little take, uh, and and it works very well. Even as I said, for a hardcore historian who actually do believe in kind of objectivity and hard facts, in fact, um, it's, it works well uh, it, it, because it's not entertaining in a sense of simply entertaining and leading us by the nose somewhere where we don't want to go. So it's a discreet and it was presenting something very complex in a way that I unexpectedly realized was intelligent <laughs> because there are so many, you know, there are so many other ways we could have been horrible uh, if you went that we didn't, so this is very, very good. But just a small <laughs> um, rejoinder to what Anna said, you know, when we, I mean, the history of knowledge is uh, uh, progressively, <laughs> There's an augment, augmentation of data as we go from, I don't know, BC period to today. So, obviously, uh, 19th century, 20th century, uh, we, we have so much data that we don't know how to store it. I mean, people in Princeton are working on how to store meteor meteorological data because you have to have a special machine to store huge databases. Uh, parchments or um, fragments from from the Chinese caves, uh, even Genita manuscripts that are fantastic uh, documents are still don't give us the whole story. There are still there are thousands of letters, Genita letters, but uh, they they are on, some of them are on media, not all of them. They they are still difficult to, to, you know, it's not the whole story. We are not telling the whole story. So, when I was, uh, in, when I was talking about the Europeans uh, from the 16th century, this is the moment when this accumulation of knowledge, botanical knowledge and all, starts. Of course, they, they use, uh, they incorporate knowledge of all the peoples they encounter everywhere. They encounter in America, in Africa, in China. They, they grab it all, they put it in their botanical books. In fact, uh, paintings of uh, these botanical albums like Van Gredes uh, and some of them uh, Portuguese, but less prominent, are the first pictorial representations, quite realistic representations of the plants, although there are others. So, um, and in the 16th century already, there is one historian who did research on that, Brian Ogilvy, yeah, uh, who said that already by the end of the 16th century, there was a, a traffic jam, a jam of too much information coming from the world. Uh, so, so, yes, this knowledge is more visible, and yes, we have to go back to reclaim uh, knowledges from the pre-colonial era, but one problem with reclaiming old traditions is that they are today, and if we study them today as anthropologists, that today they are already, we are mixed, we are already very much mixed. Uh, like Indian food, what would you do without tomato? And then people talk about sitaparam, right? Sitaparam is uh, Brazilian fruit. Uh, so, you know, we are so mixed, we sometimes, uh, it's very, it's a difficult and worthwhile task to, uh, to discover the originary, the, the first, the authentic, knowledge, but I think it is, um, well, I, I say good luck. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Anna, do you, do you, can you hear me? Yes. Um, can I ask you the same question? What is interpretation to you? What does it mean? What? I'm sorry? 
can I ask you the same question? What is the interpretation for you not in your work or in, in the way that you see it? What, what was the, you know, you're cutting out. So what did you, would you please repeat the question? The act of interpreting, interpretation, what, the, what is it for you if you were to define it shortly? Because I mean, like, uh, you're talking, what were my goals? Is Venkat, perhaps you can, uh, what is interpretation of my work? For or, you, in your work, yeah. You know, I don't know if I understand your question correctly. Um, if, if you're talking about how, how do I interpret all this work that I have done, um, interpretation. Interpretation is um, looking at, okay, I'm looking at Vanguard's um, WhatsApp information because he's defining the question for me. So, um, Interpretation is actually very much dependent upon, of course, the individuals or the perspective from which, from where you do it. So my, um, uh, my um, feeling about it is that interpre interpretation of knowledge as we know it, of history, has often been from one perspective, most often. So it is time at least from my perspective, to look at it from other points of view. So for me, interpretation of information that is available uh, has to come from different, different perspectives. And what I have done, I think, is to take existing materials and try to interpret it uh, perhaps as, um, as clearly as I see it. So when I look at all the European documents, as well as all of the materials that I find around the world on trade, knowledge transfer, information transfer, and so on, I see it somewhat differently. Because for me, it, it is all um, coming out or emanating from knowledge, indigenous knowledge knowledge that was the source of all of the um, interpretations that have been made from it. So when you talk about, yes, Brazil, there were, I think I heard Ina saying something about um, some fruit from Brazil or somewhere. Of, co of course, yeah. they're, they're all connected. Uh, informations have been exchanged, but of course there are some, it's like a fountain. Okay? A fountain is, burst, is, is giving forth, uh, but there is a focus to the fountain. And I think some of the focuses of, of these knowledge systems have, have, are only recently being acknowledged. And as we know that written texts or documents on Indian traditional medicine that go back to the fourth and even in perhaps as, for, as early as the second or third century, you know, exist. So it wasn't just knowledge that was scattered around that were actually only recorded after the European encounter with India. So for me, interpretation of uh, this material comes from very different points of view. And um, if, if you go back to the Rig Veda, for example, there are quotes from the Rig Veda that is actually in the exhibition that I did for Google, which talks about he who has knowledge of the herbs and you know, he is a um, demon killer and a plague dispeller. So the, 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 the fact that there were individuals with profound knowledge to alter not, um, and the, the state of the mind and the body but what that type of information was available for a very, very long time. And of course, in India, a lot of the knowledge was oral and was passed from generation to generation, but they were also very early documents. And this is also true, for example, for Chinese medicine. 
the 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 you know yellow emperor's classic of Chinese medicine actually dates to the second century AD. So for me, interpretation means that you take what is what is available and you look at it from different perspectives. Does that make any sense to you? Yeah, it totally makes sense. But the thing, I think we are with some time over. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Anna, for being here at this time. We have to close our community. Um, and uh, thank you, Abhishek. And thank you, Eunice. It's a pleasure to see you.